Hi, it's time for chapter four. Um, we left off chapter three where Janny was at Larry. Sorry. Um, Janny was at the cake decorating class with her mom. And at the end of it, she went, wait, what's the birthday on the milk cart? And then she was like, is that my birthday? And then we're getting into chapter four. So here we go. A little darker out, need the fire to see. All right. She slept soundly. If she dreamed, she did not remember when she awoke. How strange, thought Janny. You'd think if anything would give me nightmares, it would be this. She got out of bed. Janny loved nightwear. Sometimes she was in a pajama mood and she had flannel pajamas, silk shorty pajamas, uh, and sweet cotton and lace pajamas. Sometimes she preferred nightgowns and she had everything from um, br bridal type gowns to teddies. But recently she had gotten into sweatshirt stuff. This new gown was of a so this new gown was a soft pearl gray, like a sweatshirt to the floor. She peeled the gown up and over her head and stared at herself, naked in the mirror. She liked her body. Morning sun streamed in the window. It caught on the prisms Janny had been given uh, for some elementary school science project and had never taken down from their plastic strings. Miniature rainbows danced across the walls. She held out her hand and caught one in her palm. On the desk was a spray of reference books given over the various Christmases and rarely touched. The dictionary was a huge dark blue Webster's. She looked up nightmare from Middle English, knit, night, and Anglo-Saxon mare, demon. Then she looked up daydream, a pleasant dreamy thought. Below it, there actually was a word, daymare, defined as a nightmare taken place in day. Demon, thought Jenny. That's what it was, some demon, some goblin or troll forcing a dame mare on me. In school, the boys were particularly sophomoric. Janie adored mischief, if she could watch rather than participate. She was perfectly willing to cheer the boys on, as long as she ran no risk of getting punished along the way. Pete had a huge roll of masking tape left over from an art project. All the kids were attracted by the tape. Everybody wanted to rip off a piece and tape things together. We could tape Sarah Charlotte's mouth shut, said Jason, laughing, ready to do it. Tape the trash barrel lids closed so nobody can throw anything away, Adair suggested. Or tape Ellen Winter's braids to her back. Nobody liked Ellen Winter. Nobody ever had. Nobody ever would. The poor thing would have nobody to untape her. No, let's tape, let's tape Jenny's hair down, cried Jason. <coughs> Blair, sit down. Sorry. Come here. At last I'll have breathing space during lunch. Well, just, we'll just wind the whole world around her forehead until hair is finally under control. Janny shrieked with mixed horror and delight, protecting her head with her arms. She considered whether to yank her sweater over her hair and run screaming down the halls. Sarah Charlotte shuddered, imagining this fate. You never get it off. We'd pull the tape away, we'd scalp her. You say to somebody lock this boy up, he's sick and twisted. I like that in a person, said Adair. I know, said Pete. Let's tape all the desks together. Let's what? Let's go in the ninth grade wing. They're all at lunch. We'll turn every desk inward and tape them together. When they get back from lunch, they won't be able to get their chairs under the desks. Don't do that when we go back to school. Oh, that's a great idea, said Sarah Charlotte. What a gift from us to them. Think how they'll waste the whole period trying to untape desks. There was silence while each debated whether the pleasure would be worth the pain. If they got caught, or whether they'd rather just sit there and have lunch, or if they'd be wimps, or if they didn't follow through with it now. Adair, who was going for her driver's test the following Monday, and who carried her driver's ed book with her everywhere, was not interested. Don't let's do that, she begged. Somebody test me on stopping distance and said. Jenny flipped the book up open and read aloud the questions on stopping distance. Adair got them all right. She had the entire book memorized. I'm so afraid I'll forget something when I go for my test, said Adair. What if they won't give me my license just because I didn't remember to bring my birth certificate? Then we know what a dumbbell you are, said Jason. If you're that dumb, you don't deserve a brownie, so just give me your dessert. Janie's body turned to ice. I have no more control over my temperature than I do of my day mares, thought Janie. She said, you have to have a birth certificate to get your driver's license, Adair? Now her interior betrayed her. All of the organs in her chest and, abdo and abdomen shuddered and rippled. I don't want to know, thought Janie, because, because why? Does something deep inside me already know? 
but why now? Why haven't I known all along? How could I, how could you forget something like your real family and the moment you were taken from them? I know I'm making it up. It's a demon. The dictionary says so. So why am I turning cold with fear? Three forms of identification, said Adair, bringing my birth certificate, which you have to have, my social security card, and my passport. Jason laughed suddenly. I remember the first time I saw my birth certificate, he said, with its little raised seal and the golden lettering at the top, and it was so official and all, the real me. And it had the wrong birth date. I practically passed out. I thought, I'm somebody else. I'm adopted. They switch babies at the hospital. I sweated so much that paper got soggy. Jenny's mouth was so dry, she could not ask questions. It turns out, Jason explained, his voice rich with relief, that there are two dates, the day you were born and the day they registered you on the records, which in, the, in my case was several days later. My eyes landed on the wrong date. Jenny seemed to melt like ice cream in the sun. She had no energy left, hardly even a mind. She pictured road surfaces in winter ripped into potholes and heaved by the changing temperatures. Ice one day, sunny thaw the next. What would change temperatures of her imagination? Would the changing temperatures of her imagination rip through her too? She had never seen an insane person. They don't mean to go insane though, thought Janny. It happens to their surface, like freeze and thaw. She had a sense that she must hold on to her sanity, the way in a crowd in the city you held on to your purse, that it would take both hands to stay sane. Reeve did not give her a ride home. She took the bus. It stopped on the corner and she had, to block. she had a block to walk. Theirs was an architecturally mixed neighborhood, originally a street of substantial older houses with front porches, big attics, and trees that dumped a million leaves every autumn. Each side had a lot built up upon. Modern ranches and cute little Cape Cods lay in between each shingled old place. Her own house was an old, dramatically modernized with sheets of glass where once there had been dark, hidden rooms. Jenny walked through the mountains of leaves in the gutter, waiting for the town crew to come with the frightening leaf vacuum that sucked and then minced the scarlet and gold leaves. She had never been able to watch. She went in the side door. Mom, she yelled. I'm here, dear, said her mother at the desk. Lists, folders, notations, all the stuff for her various causes and crusades. How was school, darling? Uh, you know, school. I had a great day, said her mother happily. My Loatian boy, he's really made, he really made a quantum leap. He's not going to need me much longer. Her mother tutored English as a second language. The Loatian boy had one interest and one only, sports. He wanted his term straight so he wouldn't refer to baskets or goals for basketball game. Mom, said Janny, keeping her voice light, I'm gonna need my birth certificate for my driver's license. Can I see it now? Her mother's pencil stopped moving on the form she was filling out. It seemed to Janny that her mother's knuckles tightened and whitened. Her mother said, darling, you won't be eligible for months. I know, but Adair's been talking about it and I got interested. It's in the safe deposit box at the bank, said her mother. Oh, well then let's go open it. I'm very busy, darling. Let's go tomorrow then. Tomorrow's Saturday, said her mother quickly. The bank's not open. Janny felt like an executioner escort escorting her own mother to the guillotine. Monday then, said Janny. Her mother said, Jane Elizabeth Johnson, you do not give your mother orders. Do you hear me? You may ask courteously, but you may not command. Why do you want me to see my birth certificate, said Janny. Her mother turned a page in her notebook and stared at the blank paper. Don't be ridiculous, Janny. Now let's have a snack. What do you feel like? I did a huge grocery shopping. New, new microwave and frozen stuff we haven't tried yet and fruit juice popsicles for you instead of ice cream. She doesn't want me to see my birth certificate, thought Janny because there isn't one, because the dates are wrong, or because she isn't in the mood to bother with the bank. In the kitchen, Jenny looked at the bread box and passed on the donuts, fresh onion bagels, and raspberry coffee cake. She checked the shelves, but did not feel like opening the double stuffed Oreos or the Malamars. She was not in the mood for strawberry vanilla yogurt or leftover pizza in the refrigerator. I knew all along my snack would be in the freezer, she remarked, but her mother had not come in with her. Jenny turned slowly, looking around at the empty room. Always after school, if her mother was home, the two of them shared snacks, discussed their day, and opened the mail together. Her mother not only remained in her study, she'd even shut the door. Jenny jerked open the freezer. Cold, ar cold air bathed her cheeks. There was a quart of wild berry, wild berry ripple ice cream, flavor of the month for her father. From the shelf, she took her favorite bowl, a Peter Rabbit bowl she had since when, thought Janny. 
all my life or since I was. Da, da, da. She wrenched her mind away from it from the utensil drawer she took an ice cream scoop. It was an old it was old with a wooden handle now split from many runs through the dishwasher. The scoop itself was pitted with age. Like a painting from the bottom up, another kitchen emerged in her brain. She saw the floor first, toys on it, yellow linoleum. She saw the legs of the chairs next and the legs of grown-ups. Then a tabletop. It was at eye level. She was the height of the table. Jenny panted like a child having an asthma attack. She could barely keep her balance. The painting grew, co gathering color and detail. Not a large room, messy. Two screaming babies, each in a high chair. The apron, the white canvas apron with a pocket of candy and a bag of Wonder Bread. She could remember the wrapper, her voice asking for milk. But nobody heard her over the screaming of the babies, so Jenny got it herself, spilling a puddle. She could remember mopping it up with a paper towel, proud of herself for making the mess and for unmaking it. She remembered being scooped up, hugged, laughter, noise, mess, commotion. That's a flashback again. The kitchen was in, the kitchen in which she stood was large, smooth and empty. The counters and shelves pounded in her head like cartoon things taking on life and rhythm. Come on, lay down. It's another dog, sorry. Abandoning the court of Wildberry Ripple, Janny ran outside. Reeve was, Reeve was raking leaves in his yard. Hi, he said. Come to help. I've got an extra rake. It's time you earned your keep, woman. He grinned. His face was rather long and narrow, and the grin was a surprise because it took up so much space. You were socked with joy when Reeve smiled at you. A French-looking beret tilted in his hair. He was thigh-deep in leaves. I've got to mow the lawn again, he explained. That grass went and grew some more. I don't know how, under a foot of leaves. Here, rake, Janny. I need you. She took the rake. Energy spilled out. Energy spilled out of her like the oil from a smashed tanker. Leaves were flung into the air. She made an immense, immediate progress. Reeve stared at her. Mm, it's coming. She raked on and on until the leaves were a mountain in front of her and the lawn green swarmed beside her. Behind her, sorry. Without catching himself, Reeve fell backward into the leaf pile and sank toward the ground brown leaves sliding over his face and chest. Janny, you have a problem? Come tell Uncle Reeve. He sprawled out comfortably. The leaves crackled in every breath he took. She sat next to him, cross-legged, looking down into his face. There was a nest hidden from the adult world. They were nothing like the pile of leaves to make you feel, there was nothing like the pile of leaves to make you feel little again. Reeve, do you think 800 numbers can trace a call? I mean, if you called an 800 number and didn't say anything, could they find out what phone you called from? I take it you're not gonna call Time Magazine for a subscription, said Reeve, laughing. Who are you calling? The Secret Service to report an assassination attempt? How did he get so close, she thought. Does he know something too? Deep down without admitting it, does he remember? He would have been seven. I could have been five. I thought I'd call the Milk Council to find out about the new research on milk allergies, she said. Reeve shouted with laughter. Oh boy, they'll really want to trace that call, Jane Elizabeth. They'll figure out they got an escaped drug running Central American dictator on the phone for when you ask about milk allergies. He laughed and laughed, put both hands around her, pulled her down into the leaves with him. Chapter five is short, so I'm gonna keep reading. The kiss was long and serious. Serious like my hair, thought Jenny. She stared amazed at Reeve, at, amazed at Reeve's cheek which was pressed against hers, and with amazement brought her lips together to kiss him again. To start the second kiss and to choose when to end it, she could feel his heart racing and then felt her own pick up speed and run with his. Very slowly, her hands crept around his face, finding the back of his cheek where his hair lay thick over, his, over the pulse. His hand, rough surface, gently touched her face. Aww. Moved her hair away with the pad of his thumb, traced her profile. Reeve, shouted his mother from the house. Reeve, where are you? Phone call, it's Michael. They fell apart, each lying bank on crinkly leaves staring at the sky. Reeve said, uh, Michael probably wants to know if, uh, well, I better talk to him. Shh, Lair. Jen, shh. Sorry, guys. Okay, said Jenny. She stood up first and began dusting the leaves off of her. She could feel leaf bits in her hair and down the back of her sweater. Reeve's eyes fixed on her hair as he moved as if to brush the leaves away for her. But then he looked down at his feet and said, mumbling, uh, see ya, and ran into his house.
Danny's heart and lungs were working as if they were trying to power the city's electricity. She picked up the rake again. Their two bodies had left prints in the, in the leaf pile like angels in the snow. She raked the pile back together until the prints were hidden and the evidence gone. Reeve did not come back from his phone call. The sun went behind the clouds and she was cold. She went inside remembering the ice cream on the counter and wondering if it had melted everywhere. But her mother had just put it away. That showed discipline, Janny, her mother complimented her. To get exercise instead of indulging in forbidden foods? And I've got a secret smile. And I've got a secret smile spread all over her mother's face. Look, she said, I've been practicing. What do you think of it? From the refrigerator, she took a large rectangular pan covered with aluminum foil, which Janny had thought was lasagna. Peeling back the foil, her mother showed her off a sheet cake. The cake was iced and white with purple piping on the sides and a cute little purple football arching over purple goalposts goal post in the center. Tomorrow we're all driving up to the university for the football game, said her mother. I'm doing dessert. Usually I go to the bakery and order lots of chocolate surprises, but this time I thought I'd make a cake. What do you think of it? It's so cute, cried Janny. Look, you even have the little team over here painted in gel. And here's a cheerleader, Mom. I love her pom-poms. How'd you do it? Each year they went for a Towgate picnic along with Reeve's family and Sarah Charlotte's. The football game, she thought. I'll be with Reeve tomorrow all day. Her heart raced. I was in a Grandma Moses mood, explained her mother. I decided to do a primitive painting in purple tube art on a cake. They giggled. For the first time in her life, Jenny regretted that Sarah Charlotte would be along with her eagle eyes and endless chatter. It's because she wants to be alone with Reeve. I just hope the cake is edible, said her mother. I haven't baked a cake in a hundred years. I use a Duncan Hines mix though, so I'm probably safe. There's no way to taste test, agreed Jenny, unless we cut off the goalposts and eat them tonight. Bite your tongue. This took me the entire day, Jenny. My goodness, what's in your hair? Leave, said Jenny. I went out to help Reeve and he got silly and we fell over in the leaf pile like a pair of third graders. With Jenny sitting on the kitchen chair and her mother standing behind her, she brushed and brushed till the red hair was full of static and the floor covered with tiny brown bits of leaf. Jenny thought of Reeve. Those leaves on the floor might be the only souvenir of, her, of their kisses. When he ran away to take Michael's phone call, he had also been running away from the kiss he had given Jenny. I think I'll do my weekend homework tonight, said Jenny, since the football game will take all day Saturday. She took back her hairbrush and went upstairs to be alone with the memory of Reeve and his lips and his rough, soft hands. Usually she passed her so-called homework hours on the phone with Sarah, Charlotte, and Adair. There was also Gretchen, Dora, and Michelle to call if Sarah, Charlotte, and Adair's phones were busy. Jenny was almost overcome with the desire to talk about Reeve. He kissed me. He pulled me down in the leaves like somebody in a romance novel where the man is so frantic with passion he pulls her off a horse or out of a carriage and onto a bed. You should have been there. It was incredible. However, Sarah Charlotte, who liked things now down on all four sides, would demand. So did he ask you out? Are you dating? What kind of commitment did you get from him? So she wanted to call Sarah Charlotte, and maybe not Adair either, because Adair would hate the part about getting leaves in her hair. Adair was against anything messy. Jenny sighed and opened her book bag, dumping the contents on her, on her bed. She never studied at her desk. She used the desktop of her cassette collection. Her cheap blue cloth three ring notebook fell out on the top, on the top of the math, biology, American lit, and world history books. It was the kind she wrote in ballpoint pen, tic-tac-toe games, interlocked initials, and assorted doodles. Jenny opened the cover. The front of the flattened milk carton stared at her. Flower dairy, the dairy that cares, 100% whole milk, one half pint. She unclipped it, turned it over. Jenny Spring looked up at her. The 800 number was like a dart being thrown into her eyes. I could call, she thought, I could ask. What could she ask? All the questions were unthinkable. Besides, what would you do if her parents were to find out their very own daughter called the authorities to announce she'd been kidnapped? Her mother, who had spent the day baking a special cake and was too tired cons to consider going to the bank. Her father, who would come home from soccer full of, dif full of victory or deflated by loss. Jenny picked up her phone. She dialed one. She dialed 800. She dialed three, four, six, seven, two. She was gasping for breath. With two digits to go, she hung up. She missed the phone. It clattered, slid off the bed, and hit the floor with a crash as loud as trains colliding. But her, her mother did not yell upstairs to see if she was hurt. Up here, it was the world crashing down. Downstairs, nobody heard a sound. All right, get a grip of yourself, thought Jenny. The dictionary is right. 
These are inspired by a demon. You have to destroy the demon. Or maybe it's just premenstrual syndrome. Except she had never previously had before, during, or after her periods. I'll think about Reeve now. She ordered herself, glaring at the inner demon. I will think of kisses and love and dating. But she thought of Jenny Spring, of parents somewhere in New Jersey who missed their little girl so much that all these years later they were still hoping, hoping by the thinnest thread they would somehow find their Jenny again. And Jenny would be safe, not murdered or raped or abused. Or happy or ignorant with another family. This, thought Jenny, must be what heavy drugs are like. Hallucinations, whether you want them or not. Temperature changing, personality changing doses. This time she dialed Sarah Charlotte, busy, then Adair. Adair had had total phone and gave Jenny 20 seconds of her time. She was on the phone with Pete, who she said seemed to be on the verge of asking her out. Then what you answer my, call, my phone call for, demanded Jenny. You might have cut him off in the moment he got his courage together. Normal person, said Adair, can never resist a phone call. She disconnected to go back to Pete. Jenny called Michelle, who did not have total phone. The phone rang twice, somebody picked it up. Jenny disconnected immediately. Rude, thought Jenny, why'd I do that? Because I can't talk to Michelle about anything. If I told Michelle about Reeve, the next day the whole school would think Reeve asked me to marry him. If I told Michelle about the milk carton, the whole school would know that I actually believe I was kidnapped. Guidance department would hear the rumors. They'd summon my mother from her, bloom, her blood mobile. Your daughter hoping you're not her parents. Your daughter's planning to call the FBI on you. Your daughter's living in a sick, twisted, perverted daydream in which her body vibrated with a frightening energy as if she could have run all the way to New Jersey to that shopping center. What if I can't get this horrible idea out of my brain, she thought. What if it sits there and growls like some terrible egg splitting open and turning into something real? That concludes chapters four and five. And I'll see you tomorrow. Have a great night. Love you. Bye.